Hello and welcome back to part two of our final painting segment. Today we're finally going to paint this car. You can see I've got it masked up a little bit different than our last couple go-arounds. I'm actually going to paint the top of the dashboard uh, same color as the car even though you're never going to see this. I'm going to paint homage to the guys at the factory who put this thing together uh, back in the day. They actually painted the top of these dashes the same color as the car and then we put the VIN number on there and sign and initial the other side of the dash. So we're almost ready to go here. Uh, booth temperature is not quite up to where we want it yet. I'm just prepping the car now. Just wiped her down with a damp microfiber rag. You can see I've done some block sanding on here. Take a look at that block and show you how I was able to do that. So if you decide you want to block sand this coat before you move on to your base coats, um, you're going to need a real light touch and a couple of tools to do that. Well, what I'm using here is a white dry guide. It's made by Merca. And this works pretty good. Um, not as smooth and as, and as easy to work with as the 3M brand, uh, but does a nice job. It's good for dark colors. And then I set up my sanding block with a 600 grit, like you saw in our uh, earlier final sanding video. So that's how we sanded here. And uh, just got to look the car over real close to make sure I don't have any bare metal spots at all. I have some epoxy mixed up just for any uh, spot touch up if I need it. And I'm going to look it over real close and uh, make sure all bare metal is covered before you put your base coat down. So let's take a look at the color and see how we got to uh, our 6601. So here's a little bit of Porsche archaeology. When I found this car, uh, inside the driver's side door pocket was a tube of original Porsche touch-up paint. It's a 6601. Yeah, and this car, even though it's a 67 model, uh, 66 was a production year for this car, and it, it came out the later part of uh, 66, so it was a 67 model. Um, anyhow, still wet. Uh, so this bottle of this bottle of touch-up paint is at least 40 years old, and quite possibly could be as old as 50. Um, the history on this car, it was driven up until 1978 until it was parked with some mechanical problems and uh, there it sat until I got a hold of it. So hopefully we can uh, bring this thing back to life and have her looking good again. So what we did on this color match, um, I was able to uh, do a little color swatch on this sample card here for the paint shop. and. Uh, what they did then is they took this this color and they did what's called a spray out. So they spray from this because it's still liquid. Um, but the problem with an older color, especially if it's lacquer, it doesn't quite cross over to urethane base coat clear coat uh, like you think it would. So they have to do some tweaking or modifying. And uh, even though we live in the 21st century now, the digital age, trying to match these old car colors, not quite as uh, computer. Uh, simplistic as you would think it would be. Um, some of them they just don't have the data and also uh, depending on brand to brand uh, their pigments and uh, base colors uh, are going to change and not necessarily interchangeable in their formulas so best way to get there is if you've got some original paint or you have some original paint on your car somewhere that you can take to them and they can match up. Now, this was done, this is our, this is our color here, uh, this was done by a uh, master here in town. This, this guy, um, close to retirement age now, He's uh, his name is uh, Tomas and uh, works at Finish Master in Las Vegas and he's been working in the paint business since he was 14 years old in Mexico City. So uh, just an absolute master at matching paints and he spent all kinds of time getting this right. I even had to take him down the hood. We had the uh, original color underneath the hood so he had to do a couple spray outs to get there. But between our, uh, our original touch-up paint and the hood, you know, we got it right on. So this car is actually going to look like it was back in the day, uh, very accurately. So anyhow, let's get on with uh, the front fenders, see how they turn out. And then we'll start this car and see how she turns out. All right, back in the booth, uh, working on our fenders this morning. Just got through the base coat and it laid down really nice. I just I can't believe how clean this Deltron sprays out. And that Sada gun, 
uh, amazing. You can dial that thing in to do whatever you want from the smallest detail to a nice wide fan. I mean, this almost looks like we got clear coat on here. But uh, looking good. This one over here. So what I've done uh, to stage these, I've kicked them out from my stands here. And this allows me to get my spray in there. So I'm not touching anything. A little bit of space in there. And then also I can get underneath these edges and uh, not have any problems. Also trimming out the inside of this gas tank in black. So real happy with these. These are turning out great. And the, the reason I've got them pointed in this direction, uh, I talk about a thing called bounce back. And with these fenders, um, this is a real typical case of bounce back where it could be a problem. So my suction is right behind these headlight buckets. And so when I hit that with spray, what I want is I want the bounce back to be immediately sucked right out of the booth so it's not contaminating any other parts of the fender while I'm laying it down. That way I get a nice smooth coat inside the bucket without any bounce back problems. And then also I'm not getting any issues with overspray from it going onto the fender. I think that's gonna work out real nice. Okay, let's get some clear going and see what they look like. Okay, I got through our third coat of clear. Everything seems to be drying up okay. The uh, only thing I encountered, just a couple pieces of dust. And it looks like I might have had on this one fender over here, one piece of pollen. Um, problem with something like pollen as opposed to just lint type dust. Here's an example right here. You see that little guy sitting right there? That's a piece of lint. You see how it's sticking up? So if it's sticking up and you have this, uh, no, no need to panic. That will polish out and block out, no problem, if it's a piece of lint dust. However, if you have something, look at this guy real close. See that little bit right there? Uh, almost, looks like, almost looks like what's left over of a fisheye. Um, and it started out as a fisheye, so how do we get there? Looks like a piece of pollen from what I could see, but on my third coat, uh, no way I'm gonna be able to suck that off with the vacuum. So there's also a physics phenomenon known as hydrostatic tension. What happens is the liquid walks up to the uh, debris and then holds itself back. So you get like a ring around it. Well, it's not contamination by oils or anything. It's just a, uh, it's just a hydrostatic tension problem. So how you fix that is uh, you want to let it set up, get it setting up um, to where it's almost flashed. You don't want it to completely flash 100%. And then you're going to have to manually go in there with a paintbrush, a real small paintbrush, and uh, a little bit of clear coat and just fill it in manually. Um, it'll look pretty bad, you know, in relation to everything else that's laying down so tight around it. But what will happen is you'll get rid of the, the indent and uh, you'll have an Audi rather than an Eni. And when it comes time to block it, you can sand that right down. It won't be a problem. If it remained a fisheye, then, um, yeah, then you'd be sanding it down and reshooting and you really don't want to don't want to go there because you can definitely put too much material on these things. So uh, no problem if you catch it in time. So when you get to your last coat, look everything over real close. And if you have a fisheye going, just manually go in there with a little tiny paintbrush. Have one ready in your booth and it won't be any problem. Is the inside of our gas tank lid. But overall, very happy with these. Don't seem like I'm going to have any issues there. Beautiful uh, 2021. This this stuff is to work with. Very forgiving. But you can have a lot of things going on. You think it's not going to work out, and this stuff just seems to work it all out. Especially by the time it sets up. Bumpers I sprayed yesterday. They just look phenomenal today. So it really does pay to use good quality materials, even though they can be painfully expensive. Also, um, I'm using PPG system here. And something I'd like to bring up to the guys who are doing this maybe for the first time or don't have a lot of experience uh, working with the paints. Um, PPG is a, is a US-based 
company, it's uh, Pittsburgh Paint and Glass, and uh, very high quality in the United States, and I'm not sure about their distribution worldwide. However, um, there are other really high quality paint systems, um, and if you choose a paint system, you really want to stick with the same system from start to finish, so all your primers, all your clear coats, um, base coats, everything that's going on should be from the same system. The reason that is is because they all use different chemistry to get where they need to get and sometimes they're not interchangeable so if you start off with you know one brand and then halfway through you switch up you could really end up with a disaster. But uh, a lot of quality brands out there sometimes you just need to you know try a few things try a few different brands and, and see what works. I've had real good luck with the PPG that's why I stick with it and uh, really easy to work with when you when you want to polish her out. Okay, that's it for the fenders. Uh, next stop is going to be our main event. I'm going to paint up the shell. Hi guys. Okay, so we're through our base coat successfully. We've got three coats down. So far, no drama. Always good to not have any drama in the paint booth. Um, everything looks real good. Color's turning out nice. She's flowing out nice. Um, only thing I see is maybe just a couple bits of dust here and there. And honestly, that's the nature of the beast. Even in your best paint booths, um, there's always dust in there, dust in the air. A lot of guys actually sand in their paint booths. So just uh, one part of this process is really hard to get away from. Uh, looking good. It's tightening up real nice. And I've used three full uh, 0.6 liter cups my base coat. So what I'm doing on my clear coat is I'm just mixing up, pre-mixing all of it um, and mirroring whatever I use on my base coat so everything's ready to go here. And uh, there's there's my mixing ratio. Four to one to one uh, out of a quart cup gives you an exact full 0.6 liter um, spraying cup. So easy to keep track of and, and know exactly how much material you need to go through. So, okay, it's looking good. Let's, uh, let's get some clear coat going and see the outcome. Okay, guys, there she is. Uh, it's been about four hours since laying down the last coat. Right now it's about 80 degrees in the booth. I was warming it up, kind of baking it a little bit. Um, shot all three coats of clear right at 71 degree temperature using a medium reducer. And that really wets up looking just really really glossy nice and smooth and uh, flows out just the way you want it that's my favorite temperature for spraying any urethanes real forgiving you get really good results with it so, I mean, this looks it almost looks wet still um, however it is dry but I'm not going to touch it get probably one more hour and then I'll pull the paper so we don't have any problems with masking tape sticking door jams nice and wet uh, this is an area that you want to put a little extra material in if you can get it in there because if you dry spray these uh, not much tooling is going to be able to get in there to polish it out and also a dry spray is hard to polish anyways because there's not enough material on it so when I'm laying down my urethane if I'm going to err I'm going to err on the side of a little extra rather than uh, not quite enough get it plenty wet. And if you're spraying in a cooler temperature like 70, um, it's real forgiving. You've got plenty of time to get around the car and work out everything you need to work out. A lot of details, a lot of nooks and crannies. You gotta try and get all that wet one pass. Uh, it seems about each pass was eight to ten minutes getting around it. The base color and the clear. The rear valence here really glossing up nice. I'm shooting this in 4K, uh, trying to get a little bit better resolution for you guys. I like some of my videos are pretty pretty poor quality. And I don't know if that's my camera or maybe Yahoo uh, film editor, but uh, sometimes they look a little bit on the fuzzy side. So hopefully the 4K works out better. Give it a try anyways. So also, I would like to say uh, a big special thank you for, uh, to Tomas. 
They're doing such a beautiful job on color matching. Just really went above and beyond. I'm so happy with it. Also, this slate gray, this was uh, one of Steve McQueen's personal favorite colors for all his Porsches. And I can see why. Very cool. Mr. Cool himself. Okay, guys, there it is for now. I will uh, upload some more videos as I uh, finish up the other panels. And uh, we'll just call this part two of the final paint segment. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.